thank you everyone for um, attending the 20th annual Poets Speak. Kathleen can give a little bit more information about how this all started. I'm sure some of you already know, um, but I've been here for four or five of them already. So that's, that's pretty fun. Kathleen Ellis' most recent poetry collections are Outer Body Travel and Narrow River to the North. Her poems have recently appeared in the Cafe Review, A Dangerous New World, Main Voices on a Climate Crisis, and Enough, Poems of Resistance and Protest. A recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Maine Arts Commission, she teaches poetry and creative writing at the University of Maine. She's coordinated the annual Poet Speak event in Bangor for 20 years. Kathleen, I turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you, Bangor Public Library. And also thank you, the English department that um, was a co-sponsor for many years and to the University of Maine Honors College who has been the co-sponsor for the last two years. Uh, yeah, this is a really happy moment, 20 years. And some of the people I invited uh, are poets who have been coming for many years. And I, I think maybe the one who's come the longest, I might be wrong about this, is Carl. Where are you, Carl? You disappeared. But anyway, I think, and then maybe Annalise and maybe others, I'm not sure. But um, so it's exciting to bring together people who have, have, have been involved in this over the years. It has changed a lot. Um, it came from an idea by the, from the, uh, director of the Bangor Public Library way back when. And, and really it was kind of a response that we wanted to do to 9-11 uh, at the time. And um, the director, Barbara McDade said, let's have a poetry reading during Poetry Month and we will talk about renewal. And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to give this the theme uh, for the 20th anniversary of Voices of Invention and Renewal. And, and so the first one was a lot of us just uh, standing in a circle <laughs> and people came from far and wide, however, and we picked poems that were special to us and then read a few of our own. And then year by year, uh, the event grew until at, at probably at the, at the largest it was, it started at two in the afternoon and went until eight at night when the library used to close. We had workshops, we had music, we had dance. Uh, we've had all kinds of things over the years and many, many, but there are certain things that, that, uh, that we've done over and over. And that, that was to have uh, people of, of other languages than English uh, read in their own language and then a translation of it in English. We've had um, young poets from the university reading, which has been very special. And we've also had um, presenting people who have recent books. And so that's what we're doing today as well. We don't have the song and dance, but we have everything else. And so it's really, really exciting to be here for 20 years. And, but this is the second year that we've had it in Zoom. So we, we, sort of, we miss the library immensely, but hopefully we'll be back there next year. And I wanted to start by reading a poem since the theme is invention and renewal. And I think of change, uh, the change in the weather gradually. It's kind of, it's nice right now. The sun is coming through. And also we've been studying uh, Adrian Rich in some of my classes this week. And this part of the poem comes from Images for Godard. She wrote a lot of poems that were, were based on, on film and, and tried to capture film in her poems. But I happen to like what this says. This is number five of the Godard poem. It's from 1970. Interior monologue of the poet. The notes for the poem are the only poem the mind collecting, devouring, all these destructibles, the unmade studio couch, the air shifting, the abalone shells. The mind of the poet is the only poem the poet is at the movies, dreaming the filmmaker's dream, but differently, free in the dark as if asleep, free in the dusty beam of the projector. The mind of the poet is changing. The moment of change is the only poem. So 
Let's get started. And our first poet is Annalise Jakimides. And if you have seen the e-poster, you saw uh, one of her works. So she's a, a multi, multi-talented artist and poet and, and writer of prose as well. And uh, so the, the work that, that I chose of hers was called The Light Calls. And it's really beautiful, acrylic, oil, feathers, dyed papers on board, really wonderful. And many of you know Annalise, she is cited in national and regional competitions and nominated for the Pushcart Prize. Her poetry and prose have been published in many journals, magazines, and anthologies. She has recorded essays for Maine Public and, the N and NPR. Recent published work includes flash fiction in the Ekphrastic Review. Her essay, I Tell Henry the Plate is Red, is included in the forthcoming anthology, Breaking Bread, out next month from Beacon Press. Welcome, Annalise. Thank you very much. Um, my thank, I just wanna start by saying invention and renewal just resonated with me remarkably. But first I want, uh, secondly, I wanna say my thanks to Kathleen and to the library for continuing this event and for inviting me. Over the years, whether I'm on the roster or not, I show up because it's just a fabulous, um, it's just a fabulous thing. In these recent odd times, I drove a lot and it was a way for me to connect at a distance with a narrowed world. And so the first three poems are drive poems with repeating images, often exact words. If you're listening, you'll hear them voiced in different forms. One is in third person, one is in first person, and one is an omniscient narrator. The titles as you hear them are actually how they are actually titled. The first one is morning drive. Called to the sky, she wakes with the opportunity to write the questions, or was it the answers? She was told the morning she learned how to whistle in open air. Toggling now between safety and salvation, she drives into the yoke of morning, the sun leaky along the ridge of restless spring limbs. It's a beautiful thing the fantasy of time cannot take away shadow of shed skin raining down over a fallow field and its solitary barn. She leans out the window, drawing lines through space and watch as all the bodies floating home. Driving again, nowhere to go, no one to see. I drive into morning, on an unknown road, emptied, shimmering, fluorescent frost. Through the open window, I sing to the dead and distant living, loud, off key, a trail of broken phrases, lost words, leaks along the ridge of restless spring limbs, shadows, a sh fallow field and its solitary barn. I speed and slow, speed and slow again, until blinded, in egg yolk dawn, I stop mid lane to dance on the dark lake of pavement. Another drive. Somewhere between the bridge and the bridge, the birds arrive. A plague of grackles woven in butter sun and bitter cold, cyclical rebirths. Fiddleheads burst through wet leaves, laundered in mint light while an old man stands in a fallow field, lunatic with love. Despite our optics, frayed tent or garish palace, solitary barn, we're all doing the best we can. Innocent broadcasts of another life. I'm always astounded um, by words and their stringing together and how they really have no desire for labels so many of mine content to have been born for this time, space, moment, the journey. Over time, I've realized the writer determines whether her words live in a particular box or always out of the box. 
And so I've chosen to close with from the watchbird Estrella after Sleeping Boy, an oil painting by Odd Nurse. <coughs> Excuse me. How many times the bird wondered, gazing out, I'm gonna have a drink of water, sorry. How many times the bird wondered, <clears throat> gazing out to the sea of implacable clouds, will I have to escort this one? Already more lives than he'd been taught these mortal energies could have. He's had to acknowledge that lately they've been turning around more quickly, birth, life, transition, or as they like to call it, death. Here for a minute and back at it again, hungry to jump into the fray of time and space. Perhaps, he thought, his class in transitional transportation had been minus a chapter. It had been the year of that new instructor with the long bones of light cascading from his circlet of time. Come to think of it, the light in this one's cradle is pretty similar, drenched, it seems, in a skin of light rain. No matter, it's part of the job, clarity or not. And so Estrella keeps watch until the clouds flatten and the shifting begins. Long ago, he accepted, not easy, by the way, even here. It's not his to understand, just witness. And yes, it's true, clean things up a bit. Recently, they've been bringing things with them, although the instructions clearly state the photo of your wife, the wedding ring, the hidden box of jewels, and the pile of unread books, your favorite sequined dupata, the scrumptious Daruni with the so sweet berries, none of it will be of use here. Oh good, he thinks, here it comes, the stripping, the cool flat line, the boat. I can take my break now. After, of course, I remove the gun again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our, our next poet should stand up and take a bow. Maybe he can do that, Carl. Can you stand up and take a bow? Thank you. Thank you. The reason he's taking a bow, maybe a lot of you know, because he won uh, this award last summer, uh, is that he is the prestigious winner of the Ray Brabine Lifetime Achievement Award for his work as one of the primary cultural connections between Maine and New York, writing about the Maine art scene for national publications and about the larger art world for Maine magazines. He's also the author of more than 30 art books and editor of Discovery, 50 Years of Craft and Experience at Haystack Mountain School of Craft. And he's also written a book about Katahdin, art of Katahdin with his brother. He lives on um, and writes on Mount Desert Island. And as far as poetry goes, uh, he's many faceted like uh, Annalise. His work has appeared in a wide range of literary journals and most recently in the Lowell Review, the Maine Arts Journal and the Cafe Review and have been featured in Maine Sunday Telegram's Deep Water series as well as in the anthology, Local News, Poetry About Small Towns. He has an essay coming out this spring in the Beacon Press anthology, Breaking Bread, edited by Deborah Spark and Deborah Joy Corey. And proceeds from the sales of the book benefit Blue Angel, a Maine-based nonprofit combating, combating food insecurity. So we, we hail you. We're so glad that you won that award. Yeah. I'm sure you are too. <laughs> I am. Thank you, Kathleen, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm honored to join Annalise uh, in kicking off this 20th anniversary edition of Poet Speaks. It's Poet Speak. And uh, I just wanted to mention Odd Nerdrum, um, Annalise. I, I, I want to go back and look him up again. I, I remember him from years ago. He's one of the most mysterious painters uh, that, that, that I've ever, whose work I've ever seen. So anyway, I'm glad to be set back on his track. Uh, so prompted by the title of this event, I went looking for poems of invention and renewal. I found a few among my own work, but some doozies by others. So I thought I'd start with Naomi Shihab Nye's Burning the Old Year. Burning the Old Year. 
letters swallow themselves in seconds. Notes, friends tied to the doorknob, transparent scarlet paper, sizzle like moth wings, marry the air. So much of any year is flammable. Lists of vegetables, partial poems, orange swirling flame of days, so little is a stone. Where there was something and suddenly isn't, an absence shouts, celebrates, leaves a space. I begin again with the smallest numbers. Quick dance, shuffle of losses and leaves. Only the things I didn't do crackle after the blazing dies. That's uh, Naomi Shihab Nye's Burning the Old Year. Nye has recently edited a collection of poems titled Dear Vaccine, Global Voices Speak to the Pandemic, just released by Kent State University Press. Here's the co cover of it, if you can see that. And I contributed a short poem to the anthology, which, which might fit the invention category, if one takes into consideration the creation of the vaccine. Uh, the, the poem is untitled and it goes like this, and, and maybe I'll even do some singing, Kathleen. Oh, the ache in the arm is love. The woozy day after is love. The immunity is love. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling. Vaccine. Okay, back to poetry. Uh, here are two poems of mine, riffs on, respectively, Making the Bed and Spring Peepers. Is this coming through okay? Yeah, there, someone might have not muted, Carl, and I think they did just mute, so I think you're good. Okay, great. Yeah, it's sort of hearing something there. Singing was beautiful. Oh, thank you. So uh, two poems of mine that sort of fit the category. Uh, categories for today. The first one, short one called Making the Bed. Making the Bed is my job, and this morning her side is still warm as duvet is whipped straight, pillows plumped and replaced, dreams removed for the day. Some men make a bed with grace more than I can muster facing sheets that won't stay put and blanket with mind its own. Those gentlemen can smooth a running ridge and finesse hospital corners. Lucky ducks, I say, with no one else in the room to witness my hands lingering where her warmth remains. And then finally, a spring poem, truly renewing here. Um, Zones of Peeper. Driving home from a party, parsing conversations, car windows roll down to greet first real summer heat. We pass through zones of peeper, not song, not chorus, though scientists no doubt find pattern in the high pitched whatever it is, nor peep, which reminds you of silly chicks falling over each other in an incubator. Every moist venue between Pretty Marsh and Solmesville Every hundred yards or so brings this antic singing, somewhat alien in tone, magical too, like fireflies, but auditory, not synthesized, but a perfect cacophony of the higher ranges, tiny frogs doing their spring thing, flinging music into dank milieus of pond edge and marsh, inspiring a certain joy in our recap of the evening, as if every fault could be forgiven when you consider the rest of the world wild and wet and flipping out. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, the next um, group of poets are special to me. They're three of my bright students, all honor students. And one of them wasn't able to make it today. And her name is Molly Gluck. 
She's a second year English major, honor student and Cougar awardee at the university. She also studies philosophy and, and uh, women and gender studies. Although she's rather new to writing poetry, she's certainly not new to reading it. She adores British romantic and modernist poetry. Her favorite prose author is Virginia Woolf and Molly's first ever published poems will appear in this year's edition of the University of Maine undergraduate literary journal, The Open Field. And um, another poet whom I will introduce in a little while, where did she go, Iris? Iris is going to be, yeah, there she is. Iris is going to be reading a few of Molly's poems for us. Hi, um, so I'll try to do justice to Molly's poems. Um, the first one is called uh, The Breakfast Party. When they ask about last night, all you can say is that the room screamed with death. It was deafening. The walls became liquid and dripped into your ears, seeped into your skin, drenched your dry tongue. You are bloated now. You are heavy. Your silhouette becomes all of you during the night and your looming shadow rises from the bed slowly. You do not smile when you tell this story because you are not joking, but you've always had a flair for the dramatic, they say with a grin. You have always stood just so, teetering imperceptibly on the brink of some absurd emotion. You are ravenous, you cannot breathe. There has never been empty space, just you, your chest expanding, a desire to fit the world between your ribs and let the dust collect there instead. And it might even be easier that way. But it doesn't matter so much in the daylight, not when the coffee cups are chipped from being dropped too many times, not at breakfast when the butter is too cold to spread on toast. You remember reading in some book that when no one is looking, rocks lose their hardness. You wonder if this is true for butter and for humans too. And then this second one is called June part two after Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Life is never sacred for long. There is no prayer that can halt the movement of the mind and the pen continuous follows. Reality is tenacious and rings loudly through the streets. The moment in its wholeness is lost, like a bag of marbles dumped out. Green blue glass blurs into bouncing, pure movement. It would be an absurd act indeed to pinch each head be each bead between fingertips and bring them tentatively to wet lips, to hold the disparate offenders on the wide of your tongue, waiting. Then in a sudden burst of intuition, crushed, ground down to sand and swallowed sharply. One must keep things in their place. It is the cost of living. One must calculate their place. But what of mathematics? Thank you. Thank you, Iris. And now I'm going to introduce Iris. <clears throat> Iris Elise is a second year English major at the University of Maine, where she heads the Creative Writing Club and has been featured in the undergraduate literary magazine, The Open Field. In 2019, she studied under poet Richie Hoffman during a Kenyan college summer residency program. And she's been a recipient of one of the Grenfell Awards um, that is awarded by the University of Maine English Department. Hi, um, so I, I'm gonna start with one, it, it's called Airport Poem. I, I live in Ohio and I have to fly to school and I hate flying, so it's about that. Um, today I fly, I take care of myself like a small child, imagine the journey and how in need of a loaf of bread, a chunk of cheese and a knapsack, knapsack on a stick I am, fragile cargo. I ponder every poem about oranges and contentment I've ever read or heard, Wendy Cope or Marie Aguay or the others I only remember in my bones. I do not have an orange, but I have a book of crossword puzzles, the old man across the aisle and I puzzling. Always some answers I don't know but feel, filling squares before I've counted them. And then this second one is called uh, Languages of Production. Uh, one, 
If I was a distribution of globular clusters in the Milky Way, then I'd be 700 nanometer red, like the coldest and the heaviest of the supergiants, all smashed up between my palms like a 580 nanometer yellow bee, as striped as I am speckled, streaming prominence onto the hypersurface of the present. Two. Seamless as you are, seduced by illusory copper, and I am soft as your ruffled sundress florals in the autumn, and we are sewn as straight grain cross grain, wound up like a thrift store shirt never sold. Three. Onion flavor magnified several times, and night air hangs like coffee breath, so slice time crosswise into thin sections, but be delicate, blunt, varnished, and prosaic. Cook it like spinach, fry time down to nothing. Four, our most common misconceptions plague the quotidian and the humdrum such that although one might believe the primary colors to be red and blue and yellow, one would be as wrong as if one were the answer to two plus two, whereby it seems necessary to say that the primary colors are magenta and yellow and cyan, which isn't easy to say at all. Five, the effect of scale is something we don't think of. The goal is to achieve rigor without rigor mortis, to oscillate until all becomes fantastic hexagons, to understand it as you do the lines of your palm. Thank you. Are you done? You're done, okay, thank you. Um, the third student is also very special. Rachel Ouellette started writing poetry when she was about six. Years later, while in high school, she had the honor of seeing three of her poems published in Balancing Act Two, the anthology of poetry by Maine women. Now studying English at the University of Maine, she's working on a creative thesis that explores the power of poetic constraint. Kathleen Ellis is her thesis advisor. Rachel is also a member of the University of Maine Creative Writing Club, and which is called Storied. One of her recently, one of her poems was accepted for publication in Asterism, an undergraduate literary journal. Rachel. Thank you, Kathleen, for inviting me to read. Um, so recently um, I used Google Translate to write a poem. Um, I started with uh, the poem Apparition by Stefan Mallarmé. And that poor poem went through all 109 available languages as I translated translations. Um, then I, along the way, I switched each version into English to see if anything interesting was happening. Then I picked out the most interesting lines and rearranged them into a new poem. The result is quite different from Stefan Mallarmé's Apparition. The new poem is called, Don't Worry. Dream, hold hands, look at flowers. Hold your hands and dream of seeing flowers. There are flowers in dreams. Unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I dream to see flowers. Of course, it's not a big deal. Everyone should eat flowers in dreams. You are in pain, don't worry. The moon needs help. The moon will shout for help. Sweet smelling stars, snowflakes and stars smell wonderful. Do you want to eat? Eating is not difficult. He laughed at night. You laughed tonight. Who needs help? Um, so um, the next poem also uses uh, a, an interesting technique, um, the technique of erasure. Um, and for this poem, I started with the first page of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen. It's a, a short poem called Abbey. Born without a name, the world called her strong. She preferred to taste flowers, always preferring the happiest. <laughs> um, 
So just, I'd like to share just two more poems. Um, one of them is another short erasure. Um, the other one is a sonnet that was inspired by Edna St. Vincent Millay's Sonnet 90. It's called Housework. Last night, again, I saw flowers in a dream. A little dream so full of mind made light that I forgot my fears, my disesteem, and smiled till there wasn't any night. When I wake up, my elbows on the sill, I'll slowly turn away from distant skies and sweep the floor and think about the will I didn't write before I died. These eyes, once closed in sleep, will never flood again. My hands in water topped with foam, I scrub, and last year's first petunia bud is now a ghostly scent. That broken comb, that broken mirror, propped beside the stair, both seem to say, I told you, and so there. So one last short poem. This is an erasure from chapter one of Villette by Charlotte Bronte. It's called Her Mouth. A house clean and quiet, so clean. A household of teeth without flaw. A small voice opened the door. It said fire aloud, this voice demanded. Silent, mute, no. Hush, please. At the breakfast table, she was not eating. Thank you. Thank you so much. And right below you on my screen is Jacob with a mask on looking like he is at work. Is that where you are? Yeah, okay. So that, so the bookstore is open. Yes, you can talk. You have to undo. We are, yes. You're yeah. open. And I think oh. we just passed the little threshold, so I think I'm good. Oh, yes, good. we are these days. Oh, good, good to glad, know. Glad to be able to make the virtual event. Always yes. appreciated. Great. Okay, uh, next is um, another former student, Rich Hook, who is a poet based in Westbrook, Maine, where he works as a chemical engineer and project integrator in the renewable energy and wastewater remediation spaces, primarily focused on agricultural biomass energy. Rich is a graduate of the University of Maine, Orono, where he majored in chemical engineering and minored in creative writing. And it's so good to see you. Thank you so much for having me, Kathleen. I really appreciate the invitation. And thank you for the introduction. Um, I just have a couple of poems to read today. Um, on the note of Voices of Invention and Renewal, um, the first poem I have um, was one I wrote after I, I saw a, a, a young guy in Portland protesting and also kind of having a, a moment of a, of, a, of a young man's moment of frustration and self-assertion. It was, during the afternoon, he, it seemed as if he was trying to um, communicate himself into how everyone else was, was operating. And it made me start to consider when a person's identity begins and ends with our, our activities and our efforts and labors and how we choose to, to spend those either together or apart. Um, so I'll just, I'll just start. Um, uh, the last syllable. He wrapped his face in green spandex to camouflage himself and enter the minds of us passers-by. As we walk within the current venture of yet another, screaming at us to kill him, why? As we have killed, do you want so many others? Why do you want to call me who cannot? Do you want to kill me? He yells. But money isn't green and he cannot surrender himself into our body topography as we sustain fortunes amassing and dissolving. There's no one around who could wrestle him to the ground the way I did for Bruce when everyone had cleared out and I was horrible and I was nothing on the way down until his body could no longer support the thought and I held him and I held him through the return. 
This man's status is impulse unbound, but imbued with the fear of openness in the hot still moment after conflict and its duel, the warmth of beaten brothers shirt for tears. To ascend having, suffering, or having his red coat for long enough to be identified, suffering for not looking like their kids. Over and over, he asks us to say what we call him, to kill him. He has two answers and no more words for the demands he pummels into the street because aversion doesn't pass through the lips like liquor, babble, spit, or Starbucks. It is the troubled offbeat of the panic-stricken syncopation of the PVC pipe, whipping the petty procession of the crowd, like the rat laceration of the cable news analysis, clarifying as it burns his frenetic concerns. And there's no silence. His exhaustion fades into cheers from the top of the Bayside Bowl as the Friday afternoon club begins their overture to the river of alcohol blush. Another friend's friend, a swipe and swept up, rooftop yard games, bowling and passing. It is all they've got. Thank you. The next poem I'll be reading is, uh, I guess, about the past and how whenever I seem to interact with it, it, it depends on people like me who don't really know much about it to, to bring it forward. called a safety deposit box full of silver flatware. Its shade of blue flame leaves soot that smears of subversion on the delight of provisions. The sterling age now held in a plastic bag that we have never seen. The gift of silver is permission to covet and to invite coveting with the deft manner it feeds. Curse from leaving silver to tarnish his varicose veins. She lost her nerve to the cloud of expanding squid ink on the MRI. Too far to circuit the tasks of feeling, she'd asked us to bring her her pretties. She likes to have them around her, because she can feel the unwinding of sterling promises to return to rosemary biscuits and cream beside the sunflower and lavender windrow alive with the curious bees. Tilling the fields, the machine abandoned the French garden, worn down the slope of the ravine. Her covenant to the order forgotten. The dream of silver persists. That from an Alzheimer's care center in Mexico, everyone is out of breath. But she needs me to come get her, to come get someone to get her in the basement of the Krieger windmill factory to take her home. I need to go to the farm, E. Hannah and Nancy Ann, and get Clint Kripos in his truck to come get her and everything that she's riding. I'm going to need help. We have always needed all kinds of help with our love. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have <clears throat> longtime friend, Wendy Satin Rappaport, who's a licensed clinical psychologist and has been an adjunct professor at the University of Miami Medical School and taught group therapy and health settings at the University of Maine Graduate School of Social Work for 30 years so far. <laughs> Good for you. Her doctoral dissertation was on humor as a coping mechanism in diabetes. She's been trying to make people laugh and find their own sense of humor since then. She was awarded the National Health Information Award for her book, When Diabetes Hits Home, The Whole Family's Guide to Emotional Health. Her tribute to writing poetry <clears throat> as a mental health asset in her book, On the Couch with a Good Enough Poet, How an Average Neurotic Became an Average Poet, happily psychologizing along the way. That is really the entire title of her wonderful book of poems. Okay, Wendy. Thank you so much. I, I feel as a appreciative as the good enough poet that I'm invited here with my profound colleagues and my wonderful uh, creative mentor, Kathleen, and Ellen Goldstein. 
Um, all right, first is starving, inspired by the fullness of things, Jane Hirschfield. Entrance, exit, Zen, science, self, others, fury, love, red states, blue states, I'm right, you're wrong. Not me versus you, I see your point of view. For and against, fair play laments. Empathy drought, all in or all out. Not me versus you, I see your point of view. Do over, nuance, confluence, reliance on alliance, ability and civility. I see clarity in our similarity and see our parity. Do you see me bitterness free, daring to be caring, grieving, repairing? Not me versus you, I see your point of view. Ah, I'm hungry to feel the fullness. Roots, we've got to get to the bottom of this. Put it under the microscope, begin at the beginning. America in analysis, psychoanalysis, perhaps a cure for destruction and paralysis. One nation under God indivisible, you and me, shattering with the dearth of memory. So let's look at the roots of contempt, downright hatred or indifference. I smell fear and anxiety, vulnerability and inferiority. Come close, listen, let's make mutual amends. Don't be frightened, can't we return to being friends? sharing a piece of the pie. Feelings come and we forget, they go. If we find self-compassion and honor human nature, which is a little bit of ugly lingering, it's slow. Add a touch of self-regulation, soothe the hurts, they're common. And then they pass, moving forward, we move toward our brothers and sisters with kindness. Remember, our children are listening to the lying, arguing and shaming. Hold that thought, please. I don't mean to be pedantic, but I am frantic. Do ourselves a favor and change our behavior. Out, tear down the wall, banish blame, be in cahoots, smother things with empathy. That's how we pull the roots. Um, looking back and forward. I grew up on the consciously sunny side of the street, roller skates scraping happily along the path, dodging dodging known and new uneven bumps in the road, colluding in the permissible avoidance of doing math. Growing up in Miami Beach, I knew not of spring longings. I had other goals and yearnings in the constant climb. Perhaps the lack of winter's challenges reduced reflections and understanding of time. What were we going to be when we grew up? Taking on challenges, maturing, mastering sibling rivalry. We saw the other valued inclusion. Was that an illusion? Now, devising, divisive dredging of dangerous disharmony. Fears falsely comforted by conspiracy. Bring back discourse, congeniality. Moving forward, conscious compassion, up to you and me. Vigilant continuity, weather, weathering together for unity. Come rain or come shine. Mind your manners. We flinch with assault, the physical kind. It's kind of messed up. You don't feel the same about talk, humor, that arrogantly assaults, insults, and scorns. Listen to your mother's voice. Mind your manners. Manners matter. Civilization counts on it. And my last one, I think I have time because I read fast. Get them all in. <laughs> uh, civilization. How can it be advanced when troops are advancing? Boots on the ground and missiles storming, cold climbs and hearts, diplomacy denied. Only bigger than bold bravery saves our psyches. Unable to sleep, I sit up in bed and write, pursuing hope and wonder. Deaths, slaughters, fears, and loss dominate from an alliance of hatred and defiance. The conundrum as civilized appears to deflate. I think of history class, remembering the revolving doors of nations but not ours too, please not ours. A terrible realization that civilization could sink by madmen against the world once again. What's happening? It's universal. Can we explain or contain the heinous bigotry, large and small disdain, abortion restricted, don't say gay passes, books banned? Maybe this too shall pass us. Our entreaty 
for a treaty, empathy and tension for human nature's dark side, compassion, and then strangulation, taming greed, fear, and frustration. Wherefore art thou magic wonders? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What a range. <laughs> <laughs> taking us, I think, at least me, it took to uh, the Ukraine, Ukraine and all the difficulties right, right now there. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to poets reading from their new collections. And one of our poets is unable to make it today, Stefania Irene Marthakis. And uh, she sent me a recording, but I wasn't able to make it work. So hopefully she'll be in a reading soon and you'll be able to hear her read from her new book. So first uh, is Claire Millican. And Claire's poetry has appeared in numerous literary journals and magazines. She's the author of the poetry collections Ransom Street, State Fair, State Fair Animals, Tartessos and Other Cities, Television, and Motels Where We Lived, among others. The poems in her latest book called Dolls provide an unforgiving look at the price of traditional femi femininity, especially in the South. Millican teaches at the University of Maine Orono and Bates College. She has spent much of her life in the South and currently lives in Owl's Head, Maine. Claire. Yeah, so thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, I, you know, there are not many poems in this book that really have to do with like renewal. And so I have to, try, you know, I kind of trust that Kathleen knew what she was doing when she asked me to read at this event. And so I've been trying to think about, you know, how can, <laughs> how can I bring renewal into it? And um, yeah, the best I could come up with, which is pretty good, is that Kathleen is here and Wendy is here and Ellen Goldsmith is here. So the, the three graces of my own poetry world are here. And, you know, that seems pretty good. So um, I'm going to start off actually reading a poem by um, Constantine Cavafy. Um, I didn't know that Stefania wasn't going to be here. So I, um, you know, I was trying to make that connection with Greece. And this is a really short one. And then I'll just dive in and read a few poems from Dolls. I don't want to overdo it. Um, I'm going to be reading a translation. So I hope that's OK. In the same space. Surroundings of home of social clubs of the neighborhood that I behold and where I walk year in, year out. I brought you into being amid joy and amid sorrows, along with so many events, so many happenings. And you have come to be entirely a feeling for me. It's kind of an interesting, somewhat enigmatic poem. Um, I think he might be talking about poetic creation. Um, incredible poet. And I know this reading would be much better if I just stayed and with Kavafi and kept reading Kavafi, but um, <laughs> I, I'm gonna be kind of moving on to the poems from Dolls. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, yeah, the, the book is really about the South. Um, it's very much focused on Charlottesville where I lived and taught for many years. And um, in particular, um, there's an extended um, elegy for Sage Smith, who was an African-American trans woman who disappeared from Charlottesville in 2012. Um, and I, you know, it's really kind of grappled with um, not just what happened to her, but how the community responded. Um, so, you know, some of the book is about that. I wasn't going to read those poems today because there's not, um, it's not as hopeful a theme, um, not that the ones I've chosen are that hopeful, but they're at least a little bit glimmering with hope. So this one is called Anorexic Girl. Anorexic Girl. I got curious about the etymology of the word girl. It did not always mean female. Originally girl meant small, ignorant, lacking heft, intellect. Some philologists say that girl once connoted worthlessness any living creature considered weak, whether human or animal. Others wager the word source more obscure. No one knows the first time a human girl decided to starve herself. Go further toward the vanishing people want from her. 
the penance of fasting taken up by those longing to be saints and the word girl emerge at about the same time and place, medieval Europe. Starving yourself is old, hat, it goes back, transcendent. Along the lines of girl also call girl, match girl, girly, catch words for the discardable. Finally, at age 15, after a year of boundless fasting, I stopped starving myself, but it took decades after that to lose the habit of silence, hunger's match. So that's my first hopeful poem. <laughs> okay. And um, <clears throat> the next poem is called Sister Shoe. And it's a kind of complicated one, but I don't know. It's simple too. So Sister Shoe. She tells me, play the music they played when they hurt her. She wants to hear it in a new light. Or maybe it's the only music that is real for her. Don't wear your sister's shoes, he'd say, but I'm already related to her, unspeakable grief. In the transit work of shoes, step by tonal shift, slap arpeggio, saltic grift, carry us past what's been done in the names of nations. I am a mirror of another sort, haunted by a different music. That's probably why she reached for me, play that music, I know you know it, Hold my hand, find a way through the notes. Which regime ruins you? That's the music you listen to, trying to understand the shame of it. I was named for Sarah. For Sarah, back down the line 200 years to the first in Georgia who had no choice. Um, so that, my first name is actually Sarah and um, that's referring to one of my ancestors who's a, who I've learned something about lately. So yeah, talk about that another time. Um, I do wanna leave room for Karen to read. So yeah, um, this next poem is, um, you know, like so many of the poems in this book, they're really about connections between women. Um, and so this one is about a friend of mine. Um, and so, yeah, it's called Anatomically Correct. You know it's a cheap hotel, but have no better option. Cut your hair carelessly and look like hell. Even so, at least you can see now all the way through, looking down a hallway to a mirror where the noun becomes a verb. A city only half painted, a half open door, a doll anatomically correct is grotesque, the worst. It's called the uncanny gap. You know the place is cheap, but tolerate it allowing him to smoke, toss the ashes. Childhood always ends in wreckage of one sort or another. Hence, in New Haven, taught yourself to play the piano in a small room where none could hear that private music. And Deborah gave you an amulet, a scarab of lapis lazuli saying, if you have to go home, take this with you her hands on your hair like a saint, edge of the city, St. Vincent's Hospital, traffic's oceanic curve, don't go inside or she'll never return. And um, yeah, the last poem is about ballet, which is definitely a part of, you know, required femininity in the, in the South and maybe other places too, um, after ballet. She picks me up in the blue Chevrolet, full of night sky. Evangelists, certain of their own salvation, lose the way. Dark and clean, this pure shadow of travel. The cars rusted and we ride, eating bread, bitter rye, morsels of survival. After ballet, the world is made of straws of night. She arrives. Across the parking lot, other cars turn to stone, obfusk. She throws me the keys. Not yet 14, I drive to the grocery. We buy apples for supper. The positions of ballet are fixed and formal and of whole numbers, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. In the car, we eat red fruit, 
windows open, our table of the vanishing point, spit out the glistening seeds. So thank you so much. And thanks again to Kathleen and um, the library. So. Thank you, it's beautiful. So our final reader, poet, is well known to many people around Maine. Um, Corinne Spitfire's new collection is The Body in Late Stage Capital Capitalism. Let me say that again. The Body in Late Stage Capitalism. She's also the author of Standing with Trees and a chapbook, Wild Caught. Her poems have appeared in Three Nations Anthology, Canary, a literary journal of the environmental crisis, The Catch, Writings from Down East, Off the Coast, and Currents, and many, many other publications. Her poem, What is to be Offered, published in the Kerf, was nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Corinne was the poet laureate of, was the first poet laureate of Belfast, Maine in 2007 and 2008. Welcome. Hello, um, thank you. Um, do I have time since it's 5.30? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so in terms of uh, renewal and invention, I'd like to dedicate this poem to the tribes of Maine and acknowledgement that we're on indigenous people's land and beg you to contact your senators and rep representatives to pass LD 1626 and LD906, which are two bills that have been being worked on for the last four years to set right some of the mistakes of the Maine um, Indians Claims Act and are currently not supported by the governor. So we need two thirds in order for them to pass. Liquidation. For 36 years, I've slept on some shore of Penobscot Bay, paddled the east and west branches of Penobscot River, transferred Penobscot County to Medway, Lincoln, the Golden Road, visit Penobscot Marine Museum, Penobscot Theater Company, read the Penobscot Pilot, smell the Penobscot Potato Factory, wake up to the weather on the bay. Penobscot River Watershed covers 8,750 square miles from Bucksport to the Canadian main border, extends with some easy portages to the Allagash, into the St. John, all the way to New Brunswick or over to Kennebec and down to Popham and the Bay. From the Bay, you can get anywhere, Skudik, Monhegan. I know a few of the carrying places can read the water some, know where I might find wild berries, sight eagles, great blue heron, from Castine to Isla Ho, Brooklyn to Camden Hills, Belfast to Mount Desert, know where I might go swimming, McGonagall, Pemaquid, Naskeg, names I've learned to say the settler's way, but none we appropriate like Penobscot a mispronunciation of the people's name for themselves, the river, the land, Panawawski, meaning the river, the land, the people. For some 13,000 years, 90% annihilated by incoming immigrant germs, the remaining estimate of 10,000 in 1700 fought with the colonialists in their revolution, now number under 2,000 cut down by genocidal scalp bounties, war, alcohol, child abduction. The Penobscots treated into 22 acres of their homeland, a swath of the river and its islands from Medway to Old Town. Now, the state that dubs itself Maine claims this stretch, the river, does not include the water. Panawawskia land, Panawawskia river. Panawawskia people. Talk about renewal and invention. They're still here. 
and that they deserve for the state of Maine to recognize their sovereignty, which they have never given up. So this poem is also about renewal and invention and tradition as well. What is to be offered? Ukrainian women decorate eggs at a certain time of year, late winter, at a specific time of day, night. We have made dyes, recipes secreted from mother to daughter, from onion skin, lichen, woad, and buckwheat husk, collected and strained beeswax. And after the chores and the children are put to bed, a good clean egg is chosen and a design. Eight-sided rose pattern, a border of sieves to sort impurities, a long life of meanders, and perhaps wool's teeth for loyalty, wisdom, and a firm grip. Each mark, the heating of the kiska in the candle, a dip in the wax, a line on the egg. By the end, it's nearly black with wax, memory of design obscured, perfection surrendered. The egg has sat in yellow, been daubed with green. It lingered in red, purple, and black. Before the Ukrainians, Neolithic Trapillians had only brown, brick red, and black. Their designs, fish for its sacred self, or yin-yang divided almost beyond recognition. We make eggs for our men, for newlyweds, crops, goats, to boost a boost in the rugged physical world. We do this every year. Millions of eggs holding strong. The change shackling evil to the mountain. I remember form comes out of a dark place. Tools surround us. I make the choice with my hands. And um, this is uh, only the second time I've read this poem in public. Um, it's my newest poem, White, Blues, and Reds. Blue, so blue. Blue like those songs wrapped up and tied around each other, melody and rhythm hanging, hammering out. Loves a fickle and contemptuous thing. Have those got nobody blues for so long? Not like shows, not like a telltale bit of slip, but like the elastics completely worn and down around my ankles. These daily bread blues. Nothing like my blue with the world blues. Have the dodging blues, flurry doing blues, oscillating and brawling with the stultifying lowdown done in by the litany of bloodletting, water polluting, earth drilling, soul sucking extortionists are winning blues. These I'm alive, white, seeing red blues. And ever grateful that the sky blue and the sea blue and the blue of blue that makes green, orange, red, yellow leaves shout the beauty and the glory of blue, that that blue of the world is bigger than blue me. These I'm alive, white, seeing red blues has me working something, something screeching, something red hot feverish, taking the fish knife to little white lies, slashing blank white sheets, excising white struck dumb, tearing up red carpets, kneading, scratching, clawing at white gone snow blind. Something where my blues aren't staring into a bare white canvas and my reds, my reds, are dismantling the white elephant and lining up to testify, obliging a world full of color, a world full of color. And I'll end with my spring poem coming soon, probably two years, two weeks early, given our climate change, renewal and invention. Fireworks, 
fireworks of buds exploding, lacy green clouds make light of air, whispering life, every opening, each new leaf a prayer, infusing cells, every opening, each new life a prayer, fluttering heart valves, green, green, not black oil, not crude, delicacy, feather touch, not bombs, not toxic smoke, air, fresh air, sparklers of petals bursting pink fuchsia white make light of air, whispering life, each flowering, every petal a prayer, sashaying hips, each flowering, every petal a prayer, moseying down, breath, breath, not ego, not binary hate, thoughtfulness, collaboration, not profit, not killing, living, each new, every, a prayer, love life. Thank you all precious people for being here. Thank you Kathleen for inviting me. Yes, yes. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, a great celebration for the 20th anniversary. And I see a few people here who have been in, in other um, renditions of, of this wonderful event. I see Shirley Glubka, I see James Brophy, and of course, Ellen Goldsmith. And I can't see beyond that, but I'm assuming that there are other people who have taken part as well. So thank you for coming together and celebrating Poets Speak. And which has always been, which has always been a, a reading to celebrate the variety and and uh, diversity of voices in the world. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kathleen. I just want to remind everybody that this recording will go up on the Bangor Public Library YouTube channel. Um, you can look for it there if you'd like to share it with family or friends. Um, if you have any questions about where to find it, um, you can get in touch with me um, through Kathleen. And uh, we look forward to maybe doing year 21 sure. in person. In person, yeah. In person. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, yeah. everyone. Thank you, everybody.